As I talk about the grace of God, I've talked against the Old Testament law. And some people may think, well, boy, this is just a total rejection of the law. But the Bible says in Romans 3.20 that the law prophesied the end of itself. Man, this is good news. We're going to share that with you today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on the subject of the true nature of God. And we've nearly covered two weeks worth of this subject. We've got it probably another two weeks to go. And I tell you, there's a lot of material I've already talked about, but basically I've been talking about that God's love for us is unconditional, that God doesn't deal with us based on what we deserve. And when you say that, people who've been educated in the Bible immediately see all kinds of contradictions to a statement like that in the Bible. But what I'm trying to explain is that there was a period of time called the Old Covenant or the Old Testament where God did impute man's sins unto them. But now in the New Covenant, which we live under today, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing man's trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us this word of reconciliation. God, when Jesus came, quit holding people's sins against them. He put all of our sins upon Jesus, and now he loves us independent of our personal acts of holiness or unholiness. Instead, now God's love and acceptance of people is totally based on whether they accept Jesus or whether they reject Him. If you accept Jesus, God loves you. If you reject Jesus, He still loves you temporarily, but if you persist and die living a life of rejecting Jesus, you will go to hell, not for your individual sins, but because of you rejecting the payment for your sins, which is Jesus. And so that's a new way. God doesn't deal with us based on our performance or adherence to a law. So there are things in Scripture that shows God as a harsh God, as a punishing God, as a God who wouldn't turn the other way but says, when I visit you, I will visit your sins upon you. And it's true that God said and did those things. He struck people with things. But you can't find him doing that in the new covenant. Now, there may be a couple of exceptions you're thinking of. I'm not going to say it right now. I'm going to teach on this systematically and come back to that. But I can explain that. And by and large, what I've said is just true, that under the new covenant, God is not imputing our sins unto us. Under the old covenant, he was. And there's a difference. When I say covenant, I'm talking about a contract, a way of dealing with people. And God deals with people differently now than he did before. And the problem has been that the church has mixed the two together and has told us that, yes, God loves you, and at the same time, if you do this, God's angry at you. And so it's sent a conflicting message. People think God is schizophrenic. They don't understand the true nature of God. And so I'm trying to... Uh, explain the true nature of God and show you what the real purpose of the law was. It wasn't given to help you, but rather it was given to condemn you. Matter of fact, I've used these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says the law strengthened sin. That's a radical statement. I've already talked about that, but I'd love to talk about that more. The law strengthens sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 says the law is a ministration of death. Verse 9 says it's a ministration of condemnation. Then in Romans chapter 3, I dealt with this at the end of our program yesterday, in verse 19 it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Here again are two more purposes of the law. To stop your mouth, to take away your excuses. It's not going to work when you stand before God to say, well, you know, I was raised in a dysfunctional family. This person did something wrong to me when I was a child, or whatever your excuse is. When you stand before God, you aren't going to be able to blame anybody. You are going to have your mouth stopped. You know, I've heard people before say things like, 
Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why he did this and why this. And you're going to, you're going to grill God and put God in his place. What a stupid, arrogant statement. Forgive me for being blunt. But I tell you what, anybody who's sitting here saying, well, I'm going to ask God and I'm going to tell him he shouldn't have done this and how dare him do this. Boy, when you stand before God and you see the glory of God and Almighty God is unveiled, no longer hidden because you can't see into the spiritual realm, you will be able to see the glory of God, the majesty, the purity of God you're going to have the same reaction that every other person who ever saw the glory of God had, and that is you're going to fall on your face. You are going to have your mouth stopped. You're going to be saying, Thank you, Father, that I didn't have time to say that stupid thing that I was going to say and grill you about this. You aren't going to be given any explanations. None of you are ever going to sit there and talk back to God and critique God and rebuke God. Right now, he's staying silent. Now, he speaks through the Holy Spirit and he speaks through people like me. Right now, God is speaking to some of you, but God's not going to show you his majesty and glory. Some of you are shaking your fist in the face of God and thinking, if there was really a God, let him come out and show me. That's like, you know, I heard a person one time, that, like, that's like a grasshopper standing on a railroad, you know, one of the rails on a railroad, and saying, I don't believe there's a railroad. I don't believe that there is really a locomotive and trains. I don't believe they exist. If there is a train, then just let them send a train out here and run over me right now. And so here's this little puny grasshopper standing on this rail saying, I defy trains. If there is a train, come run over me. Do you think that they're going to send a locomotive a hundred miles out into the desert to run over that insignificant grasshopper? <laughs> now, if he stays there long enough, he will encounter a train. He will find out that they're real. But in a similar way, some of you are shaking your fist at God. God, if you're real, just prove it to me. Strike me dead right now. You know what? God's got a lot more important things to do. But um, you know what? God loves you. God does love you. But he's not going to strike you dead when you shake your fist at him. But I can promise you this, when you stand before God and you see his glory and majesty, your mouth is going to be stopped, exactly like this says. And the law also said that it made all of the world become guilty before God. When you stand before God and you see pure holiness, pure goodness, you are going to see your relative unholiness. You know, just my personal example, my personal life. I was born again when I was eight years old. I lived for God the best I knew how. And I was holier than most people. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never even tasted coffee in all of my life. And some of you are saying, coffee? Well, are you saying that coffee is bad like booze is? No. You got a scripture to stand on for coffee. The scripture says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm just saying I lived a holy life. But you know what? I couldn't stand before God based on my holiness. And the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968, showed me how unholy I was. And... I don't know how to explain this to you. It wasn't something that... It's not like I saw this with my physical eyes, but just all of a sudden, God revealed himself to me. It was just intuitive. I just knew some things. I can't explain this. I don't have an explanation for it. But I, all of a sudden, got ushered into the literal presence of God, and I saw God, not with my physical eyes, but I saw him in my heart. And I saw the holiness and the purity of God. And I mean in an instant like that. I recognized that compared to God, I was worth all of the judgment that God could put on me. And again, I say I was a relatively holy person. And you know, some people have come to me with things and they say, well, I wonder how a holy God, a loving God could damn a person to hell. And people say, I just can't understand how a loving God would ever send anybody to hell. Well, a person who says that has never seen the holiness of God. 
And if you don't have a revelation of what I'm talking about, I'm not sure that I'm going to convince you right now. But I can just give you my personal testimony and also this is absolutely true. Every single time a person saw the glory of God recorded in Scripture, without exception, they fell on their face and said, Oh God, I'm unclean. God, I'm undone. They instantly saw their relative unholiness. Any person who's saying, I can't believe God would send a person to hell if he's really a loving God. You've never seen the holiness of God. You don't know how bad sin is. If you ever saw the purity of God and what He intended us to be and how much we've corrupted what God intended us to be, you would have the exact opposite reaction. You would think, you know what? There isn't a hell deep enough or an eternity long enough for me to ever pay for the transgression I've got against God. And that's absolutely true. Even if you consider yourself to be a good sinner, Man, there isn't a hell bad enough for us. But praise God for His mercy and grace that He placed all of our judgment on Jesus. And the good news is that you do not have to pay for that sin. Jesus paid for it and it's just up to you to accept it. But see, this is what the purpose of the law is. The law is to shut your mouth and to make you guilty before God. So 1 Corinthians 15.56 says that the law strengthens sin. 2 Corinthians 3.7 says that the law was a ministration of death. 3.9 says it was a ministration of condemnation. Romans 3.19 says that it stops your mouth. And Romans 3.19 says that it makes you guilty before God. Those are all functions of the law and all contrary to what most of us have thought God gave the law to accomplish. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Man, what a strong passage this is. By the deeds of the law, or in other words, fulfilling the law, keeping all of the rules and the regulations, nobody is ever going to stand right in the sight of God. That's a powerful statement. And you know what? There's many people today involved in religion who have heard a perversion of the gospel saying that yes, you have to have Jesus as the foundation of your faith, but then you've got to add to it your own goodness. And they are trying to be accepted with God with just a little bit of Jesus, but mainly their own goodness that's a perversion of the gospel and this says nobody will ever stand before God based on their own goodness. People who are trying to just mix their holiness with Jesus' holiness are going to split hell wide open because it's either you trusting in Jesus as your Savior or you have to be your Savior. You can't have multiple Saviors. It isn't Jesus plus you. Jesus plus anything equals nothing, but Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Well, that's a powerful statement. So nobody is ever going to be justified in the sight of God through their own deeds. And then the last part of this verse says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here's another thing that the law did. It gave you knowledge of sin. Not knowledge of salvation, not knowledge of your forgiveness of sins. The law doesn't show you any of the good things of God. It doesn't show you the mercy of God. It doesn't show you the grace of God. The law shows you your sin and shows you your worthiness to be judged for that sin. Or you could say it shows you your sin and your unworthiness. But the law doesn't show you the goodness of God. It shows you the wrath of God. And that's the reason that most people are so condemned and feeling under the wrath of God is because they are under the law. So the law strengthens sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. It kills, 2 Corinthians 3, 7. It condemns, 2 Corinthians 3, 9. It stops your mouth, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. It makes you guilty before God, Romans 3, 19. And Romans 3, 20, it gives you a knowledge of sin. There's six things that I've already pointed out that the law does, and every one of them is negative in the sense of relationship with God. It doesn't help you towards relationship with God, but instead shows you your lack of relationship with God and condemns you over it and makes you despair of ever solving 
solving this problem on your own and it drives you to call out to God for mercy. If you use the law for that purpose, for somebody who's deceived and thinking, I'm such a wonderful person, God's got to accept me. If you beat them up with the law, the way that religion is beating Christians up with the law, well then that would be a right way to do it, to drive them to their need to God. But once they come to God and cry out for salvation, then it's wrong to tell Christians that they are still condemned and God's angry and God's going to get you and make you guilty and give you a knowledge of sin. As a matter of fact, as I continue through this series, I'm going to actually show you in, Second Corinthians, or in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, that because of the new covenant and what Jesus did, we shouldn't even have any more conscience of sin. We should not be sin conscious. I know some of you choked on that and say, oh, I can't believe it. Well, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2 and read it. If there could have been an offering given which would have produced life, well then, we should have had no more consciousness of sin. In the Old Testament, that wasn't a reality, but it is a reality in the New Testament. Jesus is that sacrifice to end all sacrifices, and the benefit of it should be that we shouldn't be sin conscious, success and failure conscious. We ought to just be conscious that through Jesus, God loves us and God has accepted us. Boy, that's powerful. And it goes on to say here in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, Now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets. That's just saying that this isn't something that is brand new and that wasn't in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant prophesied the end of itself. It prophesied that there was something better coming. It prophesied that there was coming a Messiah that would totally change the way that all of this worked. So this isn't a brand new revelation. Paul and all of the apostles weren't heretics that were changing everything. No, the Old Testament law, the writing of the prophets, prophesied that there was coming a change. This wasn't new. This was just a fulfillment of what had been prophesied before. So that's what this is saying. And then it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Man, that is powerful. Again, these verses have been used, especially Romans 3.23, to say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And basically that verse is used like a club to tell people, you're a sinner. You've come short of the glory of God. You need to be saved. And did you know all of that is absolutely true? But taken out of context, it is used in a way that is opposite what is really being said. This is saying... In verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the, per, but the point that is being made is verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. In other words, we're all likewise sinners. We're all likewise condemned so that we can all become justified freely by His grace. The emphasis is that in order for you to get this freedom of justification by grace, you've got to humble yourself and admit you're a sinner. And instead of using admitting you're a sinner as a stepping stone to becoming righteous in the sight of God, the church has basically been just preaching that you are a sinner. Get saved and forgiven of your sins and then they'll still tell you you're a sinner. They'll say you're an old sinner saved by grace, but you're still a sinner. No, I was an old sinner, but I got saved by grace and now I'm changed. I've become a new person and I am not a sinner anymore. Does that mean that I don't sin? No, that's not what I said, but I'm not a sinner. No more than a person before they get born again, you know, are, is that saying that they never do anything right? No. Lost people can be good people, and they can live moral lives, and they can be good people, but that goodness doesn't change their sin nature. They are still a sinner regardless of how much good they do. 
But conversely, when you become born again, you can still sin, you can still make mistakes and do things wrong, but that sin doesn't change your righteous nature and make you a sinner any more than your good works could change your sinful nature and make you righteous. You know, I just summarized Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 22. If you'd turn over and read that, that's exactly what that's saying. And I tell you, we have just done some damage to people by using the law to beat them up thinking that this is a positive thing. No, all of sin comes short of the glory of God so that we can all be justified freely by the grace of God. If you use the law to show a person their need for God, then that's the right use of the law. But if you use the law once a person has come to God and continue to show them that, well, even though you're born again, God's still angry at you because you got drunk again, because you cussed again, because you did this and this, and God isn't going to answer your prayer. God won't move in your life. You can't tell me God will use a dirty vessel. I want you to know God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to use. See, that's a wrong use of the law. We use the law, the commandments to show a person how far short they've come of what God intended them to be so that they will turn from their self-righteousness and call out to God. But any other use of the law is wrong. And the problem has been is that the church as a whole today is using the law to motivate Christians instead of using the love of God to motivate Christians. Paul said it's the love of Christ that constrains us. I believe that's 2 Corinthians 5, 16 or 15. The love of Christ constrains us. Once you get born again, you shouldn't be driven to serve God out of fear of punishment and judgment anymore, but instead you serve God out of love. And you know, my own personal testimony bears this out, that I got born again when I was eight, but I came under the law, this concept of I've got to do all of these things right. And so I did a lot of good things. I didn't do a lot of bad things. But you know what? I was just serving God minimally. But when I had this encounter with the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, and God revealed His love to me, I became so zealous for God that I was obnoxious to people. I know I was. But you know what? It was because I loved God with my whole heart and I was so zealous for God. I served God a million times more through love than I ever did out of debt an obligation. And there's some of you watching this program right now that you may be straight as a gun barrel but twice as empty. You're doing everything right. But you know what? There's no joy and you are doing the minimal amount you have to and you're afraid to serve God out of love. You're thinking, if I just let myself go, I'd, I'd do wrong. No, it's just the opposite. If you're truly born again, you'd serve God better out of love than you ever have on purpose through fear of punishment and judgment. Love would compel you to serve God in a greater degree. And I tell you, that's what the New Covenant is all about. The Old Covenant drove people to God out of fear. The New Covenant draws people to God out of love. It's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance, Romans 2.4.